Um, ladies and gentlemen, I just, you know, I would like to address your first concern and tell you that uh, I know what you're all thinking and the answer is no. I am not just really far away. Not far away, actual cripple. It's fine. Um, and I am also an atheist, obviously. It kind of goes without saying in this room, doesn't it? Also an atheist. And I've been an atheist for a long time, ever since I first heard that there was only a stairway to heaven. <laughs> I apply the same rule to God as I do anyone else. If the host can't provide access, I don't come to your party. Um, I, uh, I, must, I must warn you, I do drop the old C-bomb a little bit in my comedy sometimes, um, and I feel the need to warn people because people get a little bit offended, but look, I just, I really love the word cripple. So, and it makes people uncomfortable. This gentleman down the front looks like he really wishes I'd said can't. Look, and cripple, it is a bit un-PC, but I am frankly not a fan of what they've replaced cripple with. You know, it's special needs. We're all supposed to be special needs these days, aren't we? Well, look, if there's one thing I've learnt from 30 years of being a cripple, it's that special is just a code word for shit. <laughs> special schools, special buses, special scissors. Those were especially shit. And look, I don't know what they thought I was going to do if I'd gotten my little crippled hands on the normal kid scissors. I wasn't going to fucking run with them, was I? God. And you know, even the term person with a disability, I'm not a huge fan of. I think person with a disability makes it sound like my disability is something that I carry around with me. You know, like my, one day I might get halfway to work and go, ah, oh, fuck, forgotten my umbrella and my disability. Back we go. <laughs> and that we've, we've got those ads on TV now, haven't we? Those ads that tell us to see the person, not the disability. I reckon that sounds pretty tricky. Like, it needs to come with some very specific instructions. Like, is it like those magic eye pictures that were really big in the 90s? You know, like if you maybe you have to blur your vision. In fact, I th well, I've got a good sample in this room. Let's all try it. If you all blur your vision, cross your eyes. A little bit, a little bit. Okay, everyone tip their head to one side. Let's all go to your right for the sake of, for the sake of consistency. Good experiment conditions. All right, now, blur your vision. Look at me. Hold it. Hold it. Am I five foot seven and ambulant? <laughs> I take that as a no. <laughs> I noticed that a lot of you in the audience this evening are, in fact, five foot seven and ambulant or thereabouts. Um, and I just want to say that I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm completely comfortable with normal people. I'm not racist against normal people at all. In fact, some of my best friends are normal. <laughs> yeah, in fact, I know I'm supposed to be kind of being funny, but I just want to be serious for a moment and tell you that I think you people are just amazing. You are just so brave. I can't, I can't help but smile to myself when I see you on your outings. I don't know how you do it in your condition, but it's amazing what you people can achieve with a positive attitude. What's the word I'm looking for? Oh yes, you're an inspiration. Yeah, I, um, I emceed a kite festival not long ago, which was fun. Um, but when I was asked to do the gig, I knew absolutely nothing about kites. Uh, so I did a bit of research and I found that under the Good Order of Towns Act 1966, it is illegal to fly a kite to the annoyance of another person. Hmm, I know. I thought, no, kites are so lovely. They're lovely things. You could not possibly fly a kite to the annoyance of another person. You know what? After seven hours at a kite festival, you can fly a kite to the annoyance of another person. Yeah, you can also be a brass band to the annoyance of another person. Yeah. 
You can also be an overindulged child from a set of hippie parents to the annoyance of another person. Have this kid, uh, I get a lot of interesting reactions from children actually, which is kind of fun. Um, but this kid at the kite festival, he looked at me and he looked up at his mum, he looked back at me, he looked up at his mum again and he said, Mum, why is that little man wearing a dress? <laughs> it's not usually the first thing on children's minds, but anyway. Um, I used to work at the museum actually, among my people, the scientists, and uh, we, I used to get lots of, lots of very interesting reactions from children. And I think my favourite was a young man who was staring at me and he looked quite baffled. And I said, oh, is there a question that you'd like to ask me, young man? And he said, yes. Are you imaginary? <laughs> yeah, like all his friends had imaginary friends that he'd heard about and he spotted me and he went, that's what they look like. Awesome. You know, and I mean, a lot of people have imaginary friends these days, don't they? Tony Abbott. <laughs> George Pell. Margaret Court. Um, <laughs> uh, I, um, I've been flying a lot recently. I'm in, in an aeroplane. I'm not a, a magic cripple. Um, but I find, I find airport security really difficult to deal with. Might be because of my undeniable Middle Eastern appearance or something. <laughs> I don't know. I think it's probably got something to do with my requirement to, to travel with a very large chunk of steel. Um, and uh, I, I always take a part off my chair. I take this part off because the chair doesn't do anything without that. Um, and it's, you know, the most likely part to get damaged. So I always take it off. Um, and I take it off also because... I don't like the thought of a pair of 35-year-old aeroplane engineers with the minds of six-year-old boys just, you know, like taking it for a spin. I've seen Ferris Bueller's day off. That shit's not going to fly with this baby. Um, but I was being wheeled through security the last time I flew and I had this part on my lap and um, a security guard stopped me and said, ma'am, you can't take that on board. I said, oh, it's just a bit off my chair. It doesn't, doesn't even do anything without the rest of the chair. And he said, I said, it's not, certainly not dangerous. And he said, not dangerous. Not dangerous. Ma'am, you can hit someone over the head with that and kill them instantly. Now, I just want to say at this point that appearances are not always deceiving. <laughs> I am not stronger than I look. Yeah. I have no inner ninja. And, you know, I broke my left arm last year opening a box of barbecue shapes. I wanted to say to this guy, dude, I am flat out just destroying myself. I do not have time for your plane load of innocent people, to be honest. But, and, you know, if I was going to hijack a plane, I think that would take an awful lot of cooperation <laughs> from all of the passengers and all of the crew. <laughs> For a start, they'd have to turn a very serious blind eye while I took two hours to crawl from my seat <laughs> down the aisle of the cockpit. And I'd have to pick my flight pretty carefully. Like, I wouldn't be able to do it on a Melbourne to Sydney kind of leg. Like, I'd need much longer than that. Probably, it'd be probably best to pick an international flight. Um, you know, and even then, it might take me maybe two hours, and that's if I was sitting up in first, cl first class in the first place. Um, and so if that happened and I managed to crawl down the aisle, I'd arrive at the cockpit door dehydrated and exhausted. And you know what I'd have to do then? I'd have to knock. <laughs> I wouldn't be able to reach the handle, so I'd have to knock. And then the co-pilot would open the door and I would have to say, excuse me, kind sir, would you be so kind as to lift me up? so that I may use this piece of mobility aid to concuss the captain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little bit higher, a little bit higher. No, no, to the left a little bit. No, no, too far, back to the right. Up a bit higher. Yep, okay. Now, I'm a hijack me a motherfucking plane. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not a likely scenario. Um, the reason that I have been flying a lot is um, I started a new job 
kind of recently. Um, and when, you know, when you're the first new cripple in a workplace, well, to be honest, I'm the only cripple in this workplace, the only cripple in the village. Um, uh, you know, people want to, people want to kind of bond with you. So, you know, this woman would turn around in the lift and say, hello, I did a sign language course at CAE. Yeah, that's great. I'm not deaf. <laughs> and in fact, my own sign language is pretty shit. You know, I only know how to say uh, something that's quite useless. I know how to say, I hate deaf people. <laughs> Which is not true. Actually, that's not true. I also know how to sign prostitute. So I guess I could sign, I hate deaf prostitutes, or I prostitute deaf people, <laughs> which is not my new job, I assure you. Um, but people, people do, they like to show off their access knowledge. I remember my first job out of uni, um, my boss called me to the front door one day and she said, oh, I want you to come and see something. And I said, okay. So anyway, I went to the front door with her. I was looking around and I couldn't see anything and she pointed down sort of about the level of my foot plates down here and uh, she, she was pointing to on the door she'd stuck a guide dog's welcome sticker and I said, oh, that's, that's fantastic, you know, guide dogs can go anywhere by law anyway, you don't really need the sticker but it's a nice touch, it's a nice touch but I'm a bit puzzled as to why you've stuck it so far down. And she said, Stella, so the guide dogs can read it. I said, oh, that's great. That, that's great. But I don't think guide dogs, as clever as they are, I don't think they can read. And she said, well, they can probably read better than blind people. <laughs> Touché. I get to do uh, I get to do some pretty cool things in my job. I uh, interviewed last year. I interviewed an evangelical Christian with no arms and no legs. Yeah, um, he he'd given me his book before I interviewed him, um, and there was a lot in there about um, you know disability being caused by sin and stuff that I was not very you know amiable to. Um, and uh, you know even the disability bits I didn't really get. Like, my life, he's clearly trying to be all inspirational, but his life had kind of just been like my life, only my life had been with heathen parents, um, and his had not been. Um, but, you know, he, he didn't like me very much. In the book, I read that he, um, he has shoes in his cupboard um, for when God grants his prayers and he grows legs. Yes, grows legs, grows legs. Um, and, you know, we got off on the wrong foot, which is clearly my fault because mine were the only feet <laughs> in the conversation. So it was obviously my fault. But he just, he did not like my flippant attitude because um, I said in the interview, so, you know, you've got shoes in your cupboard for when God grants prayers and, and you grow legs one day. And he said, yes, yes, I have. And I said, dude, how do you know what size to buy? be bloody disappointing, wouldn't it? You wake up, wake up one day, God's finally granted your prayers, you've grown legs, you know, you walk over to your wardrobe. That's apparently how people who've just grown legs walk. <laughs> I don't know, walking's not really my thing. Um, <laughs> and, you know, you go over to your cupboard and you're all excited to put on your shoes and they don't fucking fit. That'd be disappointing. I'd be I, I would think that if you were going to have shoes in your wardrobe, for when God grants you prayers and you grow legs, you'd have a pair in every size. This did not make sense to me that he would only have one pair. Anyway, he did not like my flippant attitude. And, um, you know, the conversation eventually descended, as I knew it would, um, into him trying to convert me to Christianity. And in the end, I had to just say, look, mate, I, <laughs> I'm not going to buy into this, but um, I support your right to believe in whatever you want to believe in. 
And he said, yes, well, <laughs> he was mad for the dad jokes. There's a chapter in his book called Armless But Not Harmless. I shit you not. Um, <laughs> mad for a dad joke he was. And I, he said, well, yes, I can't be taken away in handcuffs, can I? Ha, ha, ha. Yeah, this guy really brought out the worst in me. Because I said, well, no, no, you can't be taken away in handcuffs or crucified. <laughs> uh, I will leave you uh, with this one last story of a, um, a, a man on a tram stop um, who approached me um, and he bent down into my ear and said, do you take Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour? I said, nah. And he said, oh, that's a shame because you could be healed from your ailments if you accept Jesus into your heart. I myself have been cured from the exact same situation. <laughs> really? The exact same situation. Okay, so I'm two foot ten, um, possibly imaginary. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. He looked about, he looked kind of like a normal person to me. I don't know. What's average height for you people? I don't know. I don't know. You all kind of look the same to me. Sorry. But, um, yeah, he, he said, I've been, you know, cured from the exact same situation. And he kept, kept going and going and going and going and going. And I couldn't really get away because I was on one of those platform tram stops. Um, and, but as soon as the tram pulled up and it, I, I could see that I was going to be able to make a quick getaway, I said, look, thank you so much for your input. Um, I'm just going to stop you there and let you know that I actually have a very close personal relationship with God. It's a very close relationship. Yeah, I was actually just talking to him and he told me to tell you to get fucked. <laughs> I think he's still on that tram stop praying for my little heathen crippled soul. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. You've been lovely. Have an awesome convention.